Edward Hines had the largest lumber fleet on the Great Lakes in 1914, with the steamer Oscoda sailing for Hines for some 16 years. Built on the St. Clair River in 1878, it saw its share of accidents, mostly due to storms. Lifesavers at Thunder Bay Island were called out when the Oscoda's tow, D.L. Filer, was leaking badly. It was pumped out and sent down the lake. In 1901, Oscoda lost its deck lumber and barges near Stannard Rock on Lake Superior. In 1906, 80,000 board feet had to be taken from her deck when she stranded near Escanaba. Two years later, Oscoda lost its barges on Lake Michigan and was driven off course after being hit by lightning. A November gale in 1911 almost took Oscoda and her barges Filer and Tilden. After five hours in the tempest off Michigan's thumb, she finally pulled into Tawas. In the summer of 1913, Oscoda broke her propeller on Detour Reef, stranding her crew and guests until Hines could send a tow. Lake Michigan would take another swipe at the Oscoda in the fall of 1914, when the steamer was towing the barges Alice Norris and A.C. Tuxbury out of Georgian Bay for Hines headquarters in Chicago. A wind shift and reports that the Norris was leaking caused Captain Andrew Hansen to move out of St. Ignace and follow the north shore of Lake Michigan. Blinding snow squalls made the transit dangerous, forcing them to constantly sound the bottom as they approached Epofet. At 6.15 p.m. on November 8th, the Oscoda stopped with a sudden lurch. They had snagged on Pelkey Reef, about a mile offshore of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The Tuxbury drifted to the starboard side of the stranded steamer, and it was decided they'd try to offload the Oscoda to get it to float off the reef. A tablecloth was raised up the flagpole as a distress signal, but ultimately it would be the crew who had to rescue themselves. That next morning, the Oscoda heeled over and its smokestack toppled. Their lifeboat was washed away, and Chief Engineer John Heedle used deck lumber to fashion two life rafts, which the crew used to get ashore. The Sheboygan Tribune says the steamer Robert Holland offloaded lumber from the Tuxbury and then tried to tow it back to Manistique, but it lost the barge somewhere off Sheshwa Point. Fish tugs found the wayward schooner and brought it back to Manistique, where insurance adjusters paid them $1,000 for the rescue. The tug Shank found the leaking Alice B. Norris and towed it to St. Ignace. Norris would serve the lakes until the 1930s, when it was scuttled as a break wall for northwest sand and gravel on Summer Island. Its partner in the 1914 storm, A.C. Tuxbury, would later be renamed Emba, which was also scuttled in Lake Michigan in 1932. Autumn gales were just getting fired up as the Oscoda disintegrated on Pelkey Reef. Lake Huron was next as another Heinz team was finishing loading on the far north shore of Georgian Bay. Pulling the steamer L. Edward Hines away from John Island in the South Channel, Captain Kenneth McKenzie took a bearing from Cape Robert Lighthouse and made a starboard turn to run along the top of Lake Huron to the Mississauga Strait. It was here that he hoped to tow the barge Ashland to Tonawanda in the Niagara River, but a building storm persuaded him to make for shelter on the south side of Thunder Bay Island, Michigan. After nearly 100 miles, the Ashland lurched on its side in the 75 mile per hour winds, nearly tossing first mate William Johnson overboard. His father, Captain W.P. Johnson, watched as the deck load shifted and a half million board feet dumped into Lake Huron. Their 3,000 pound anchor broke loose and crashed through the forecastle deck. On board the steamer Hines, Mackenzie said this gale was worse than last year's November tempest when 12 ships vanished and 260 sailors were lost in the 1913 storm. Ashland hoisted a distress flag at half-mast, and Captain John Parsons and the Thunder Bay life-saving crew went to her and brought the captains to Alpena. So far, Lakes Michigan and Huron had only taken a ship and $15,000 in lumber, but Lake Superior was just starting to get nasty. On November 13th, the steamer Charles F. Curtis towed the schooners Annie Peterson and Selden Marvin to Barraga, barely getting into shelter as the big lake kicked up. Captain Jay Jennings was in command of the Curtis. He was a Holland, Michigan man with 20 years experience on the Great Lakes. Jennings worked his way up from cabin boy to first mate in just eight years, spending most of his adult life with Heinz Lumber. His past four years were as master of the Curtis and the run on Lake Superior was a familiar one. Within days, his three boats were loaded with nearly three million board feet of lumber. And by November 18th, forecasts were looking typical for a fall run. 
moderate to fresh southwest winds with temperatures falling and snow likely. Jennings pulled out of Lance Bay to begin an 800-mile trek to Tonawanda, New York. Grand Marais life-saving personnel watched their barometers fall as the storm approached November 17th, with snow starting at sunrise. High surf was logged at midnight with winds out of the southwest. The mercury finally stopped at 29 and a half when the sun set, but keepers didn't see much through the blinding snow that covered their sidewalks. Low pressure overhead moved to Manitoulin Island in northern Lake Huron, stalling the system that would increase the wave observation to high surf with temperatures around 20. Beach training that day was canceled due to the storm. Somewhere in that gale, the Curtis lost its first barge, and mariners inside Munising Harbor reported seeing a Heinz boat pulling a single barge into the safety of Grand Island. The Detroit Free Press announced it was the Curtis and Barge Peterson, which heroically turned back into the storm to retrieve the lost Marvin. On Friday, November 20th, the owner of the Grand Marais Knitting Factory was traveling home from Perry's Landing when he found eight bodies on the beach. John Keating informed Lifesavers two women were among the lost, about four miles east of the station. Captain Benjamin Trudell helmed the power lifeboat Audacity to search the shoreline, and eight miles east he found a broken stern post and spar about 100 feet from the surf. Lumber was strewn along the shore, and a piece of wreckage carried the name Annie M. Peterson. On November 21st, Grand Marais again searched the area eight miles to the east and found seven bodies. The undertaker in Sault Ste. Marie was called, and the lost sailors were brought to the station by sleigh. Rough seas continued November 22nd, and the crew concentrated on that area east of the station, patrolling all day and night in blinding snow and rough surf. Deer Park Life Saving Station walked nine miles along the beach to find only lumber and wreckage scattered to the Sucker River. Surfman John Carnes was requested to return to Grand Marais where his wife was deathly ill. She passed away that next day. Hunters would find the Petersons first mate on the 25th and life-saving crews brought out representatives for Heinz Lumber to the wreckage that was identified as pieces of his ship. William Kopak's body was shipped home to Tonawanda, New York. The captain of the Peterson, John Walker, was discovered on December 4th, about 20 miles from where the crew members of the Curtis were found. Walker's son had spent several days scouring the beach for his father. Captain Walker was born and raised in Grand Haven, Michigan, but lived for some time in Sturgeon Bay, where he was police chief for several years. His son mentioned his dad's hair turned snow white from the ordeal on Lake Superior. The Door County Advocate wrote that Glenn Campbell and Charles Nelson were found to have been walking on the shore, attempting to climb over the break wall at Grand Marais. Surprisingly, no life-saving report has this account, which would have certainly been noted by the station. It was believed that two men had made it ashore in two lifeboats that were recovered after the storm. It's interesting that they were from two different ships, with Campbell being the second engineer on the Curtis and Nelson being from the Annie Peterson. Also recovered in early December was the steamer's first mate, Arvid Omen of Tonawanda. Letters in his pocket and a gold watch with his initials allowed officials to identify him and send his body home. He only had two nickels in his pocket. Heinz Lumber sent their fleet captain to Upper Michigan to identify those found, but tragically there were several who would not be claimed by family members. A locket, likely a Catholic image of baby Jesus known as the Holy Infant of Prague, was found on one woman. She was buried at the Sioux, and the necklace was eventually donated to the Maritime Museum at Whitefish Point. Aetna Insurance of Hartford, Connecticut hired over 40 men from the Sioux to search these shores around Whitefish Point for over 3 million board feet of lumber that had come off of their three ships. 50 miles south of here, another team was put on for Heinz Cargo that was aboard the steamer Oscoda. In 2021, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society scanned thousands of miles in the shipping lane north of Grand Marais, detecting over a dozen shipwrecks. We're uh, 30 feet off the bottom. This image fit the length of the steamer Charles Curtis, and the sonar also picked up an object that looked like a smokestack. The underwater camera system flew over to the stack for a look, and the H for Heinz Lumber is still there. Preserved for over a hundred years, the fleet name is clearly read on the bow, Edward Hines Lumber Company. The Curtis name has been lost, but there was only one Hines steamer lost here 
and the trout steam engine gleams under the robot's deep water lights. At the bow end of the steamer are the remains of the pilot house crushed by the waves. The command officers of the Curtis were eventually recovered, with Captain Jennings being shipped home to Holland for a Masonic funeral. The sad loss made even more tragic when 70-year-old Oris Buchanan collapsed dead during the funeral. <laughs> 